My final guest tonight is a brilliant comedian and author. Matt Ford is a comedian, impressionist, and one of the most astute political commentators in the country. Good old-fashioned British values. Grammar schools, the cane, drink driving. His award-winning podcast, The Political Party, sees him interview and debate with some of politics' most powerful and notorious figures. And recently, he's been a key figure behind the revival of Spitting Image. I wouldn't worry about some dumb TV show, Boris. I mean, how are they going to make us look stupid? Cop me done. Now, he brings us his best-selling book, Politically Homeless. Please welcome Matt Ford! Hey. It's so good to see you again. It's great to see you. I haven't seen you for, like, a year. It's so great to have you on the show, man. I, I, we've known each other for years, so this is, sort of like, an odd... Quite emotional reunion. It's but what, what I love about you, not only you're like very, um, we both got very sort of flashy socks today, but <laughs> you're very astute politically, but you're also phenomenal mimic. Like I often, because I, like I attempt a Trump, but it's nowhere near yours. Well, that is a great honor, by the way, Ricky. It's great to see you again. <laughs> it is. It's an honor to be here appearing on the fake news media. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a number of things. Thank you. There's a number of things for a Trump impression. Yeah. Everyone starts with a different thing. For me, because a lot of people do this very beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I sort of like the big rally Trump. We're gonna build and starting off like that, the big and the face. And then he goes very sad for Russell, which, as you know, is very beautiful. And we're gonna do that. And I know we are gonna do it. I know we're gonna do this. You know, one thing I did notice about him, he would pull like a little kind of I told you so face. I don't know if anyone ever noticed that. He'd go, and we're gonna do it, by the way, we're gonna do it everywhere. And I do know that. <laughs> so weird. It's excellent. It's very good. And what I love, like, not only are you very good at mimicking, you're also, like, you're a satirist that actually knows about politics. And you've got a new book out called Politically Homeless. What I find fascinating about the book is that it's sort of about um, becoming disenfranchised with politics. And in a way, that kind of feels like how... That's where we're at as a as a nation, that we've all... We're kind of fed up of it. Do you know what I mean? I totally agree. That's partly why I wrote it. I got into politics really young. Yeah, you were, like, six, weren't you, or something like that? Seven or eight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was so was creepy. So sad! <laughs> but I didn't come from, like, a political background. Right. I just come from a normal house. My mum was a Labour supporter, and that was basically it. Yeah. But I remember the day... Margaret Thatcher resigned, so I must have been seven or eight. We're walking into town, and this bloke walks past my mum in the street and goes, She's at! She's at! She's fucking at! And I you thought, thought they were on about your mum. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Usually let her out, it's not big news. <laughs> <laughs> and as he walked past, and I swear to God, I think this is partly why it's said in my memory, as he walked past, he was a punk rocker. Yeah. He carried on walking past, I followed him, and he had um, the bum cut out of his trousers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on each bum cheek, an eye tattooed on it. Yeah. So he kind of watched me as I... <laughs> as he went. And I think that kind of made me thought. Yeah. Yeah, the world needs... So it was either politics or, you know, hypnosis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So from then on, I was just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And I thought... I think all politics has to come from, like, a principal position. So I thought the world was really unfair. Um, you know, me and my sister growing up in a single parent household on benefits in the 1980s. It was very difficult. We didn't have any money. And I just thought, we're not getting a... I didn't feel like people like us were getting a fair crack of the whip. So I got involved in Labour as early as I It's so sad! Like, there's no way of talking about it that doesn't make it sound fucking insane. <laughs> well, when I was eight years old, I just thought I'd join the Labour Party. Yeah. <laughs> it's always intrigued me about you that you got into it so young. What kind of stuff were you doing? Were you, like, door... Were you going door to door? Yeah, I start, Hello, Matt Ford, you want to pull this <laughs> well, what, what were you doing? Yeah, I start, so I, you, can, you can only join the Labour Party at 15. Right. So I wrote to them at 14 and was like, I want to join the Labour Party. And they're like, you have to wait a year. And I was like, what the fuck sort of party is this? Yeah. You're not going to let me in? <laughs> that was like most parties at the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of standard experience I had as a 14-year-old. So then I joined at 15, and I would use my Labour Party membership as a fake ID. And it didn't even have my photo on it. I remember queuing up to get into this rough Nottingham pub once, and the guy was like, got any ID, mate? I said, I've got the Labour Party ID, and he sort of looked at it like that. I said, you have to be 18 to join the Labour Party. He went, I know that, mate. In you go. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, the Labour Party's the coolest thing ever. Like, we're going to sort the world out, and we can all get pissed at 15. <laughs> like, this is what's <laughs> not to like. And you've been on The Lash. Like, you were on The Lash with Tony Blair, weren't you? I was just 
Uh, this was the problem with writing the book. It was basically just... It wasn't really about politics. It was just like a drinking story. So I, I started working for Labour, and yeah. then... I was working for Labour when they were in government, which feels like a very long time ago now. And basically, when you worked on a campaign, whether you won or lost, they'd have a party at Downing Street. And you just... It was free Stella! I was, like, 18. They're like, oh, would you like a lager? Oh, we've got Estella in massive... It was, like, Freddie Flintoff's 21st. <laughs> like, this is incredible. It's, like, beer everywhere. Beer my way <laughs> Got absolutely bladded, like, so drunk. At one point, I had to hold on to the mantelpiece. To, like, this is in 10 Downing Street. Wow. They've let an oik in, and I've got... First thing I've done, I've got shit face. Yeah. And there... <laughs> I love the up. idea that Larry the cat's looking at you. Go, this guy needs a cab. <laughs> <laughs> so go on, you're hanging on to the hanging on to the mantelpiece, yeah. and we're in the room. It's called the pillared room, and that's where they have all the cabinet photos taken. Like it's a grand room. It's the heart of the prime minister's house. Yeah. And within about two hours, we're plastered. And then some guy comes in and goes, uh, "Oh, the prime minister will be in your company." I was like, "Fuck, the prime minister's coming." So I was like, "I need to piss." And I need to splash cold water on my face. So I so just running around Downing Street trying to find this. Everyone else there is like prim and proper behaving well. <laughs> and uh, I, just, I find the staircase, there's a couple of lights. There. I said, Excuse me, mate, you don't know where the toilets are, an idiot. <laughs> Tony Blair turns around. He said, um, Well, if you follow the staircase down to the bottom of the stairs, it's um, <laughs> uh, the first corridor on the left and the first door on the right. Uh, you look like you're pretty desperate, so you better get a move on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, cheers, Tony. Yeah, cheers, mate. <laughs> Damn it, like, I can't believe I've met him drunk at 18. Wow. So embarrassing. Um, and you've got a podcast called The Political Party. That's right. You interview people across all walks of the spectrum, which I think is vital at the minute, don't you think? Because we, oh, we, we live in a very, we live in very tribal times where you can either be on this side or that side, you've got this opinion or that, that it feels like there's no um, sort of transgression across lines. Because I think, broadly speaking, you're left wing on some things, you're right wing on others. I, I just don't believe this idea that everyone is rapidly one thing or the other. I totally agree. Um, and I think you have to be really reasonable with people mm. as long as they agree with you. Um, <laughs> but I interview people from all across, and I, th I find it more interesting to talk to someone that I disagree with. I'm, like, new Labour, centre-left, broadly around the middle, uh, my politics. I'm more interested to sit opposite a Conservative or a Lib Dem or someone on the hard left or a, a staunch Brexiteer and understand how they have reached a different conclusion to me. Yeah. So I just think that's... And social media and political discourse have created a skewed opinion, I think, of the country because yeah. most people have people in their friendship groups that are left-wing, right-wing, in the middle, leave, remain. Like, it's not unusual for, for normal people to have that. Mm. I think in politics, we think it's unusual because we've become so tribal yeah. that we only hang around with people who are on Twitter. We only follow accounts that we like yeah. politically. I just don't think that's the real world. And I think in the it... real world, people are used to be more reasonable with each other. I mean, the one downside of having, like, conservatives on the podcast is people email in and are like, you've got to stop having Tories on because you're making me like them. Yeah. <laughs> because you get people on that are like... I've had Jacob Rees-Mogg on, Tim Law, and I've had, like, Brexiteers on there. And when you talk to someone that you really disagree with and they say, well, actually, my issue with Europe was this, you go, oh, right, yeah, I mean, I can sort of see why. I yeah. still disagree, but I can see how you would have a different perspective to me. Yeah. Rees Mogg, right? Sometimes you ask someone the question, you think, I'm saving this up, I'm going to get in with this. And I said, uh, is it true that when you stood for an election in Scotland, you took your nanny out campaigning with you, thinking that was like, deal with that one, buddy. And he went, uh, yes, of course I did. Um, Nanny is a part of the family. She would want me to get elected. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It uh, totally demystifies it. And because people are so disenchanted with politics, there's a very serious question. How do you think we re-engage people with it? You know what I actually think happened? I think both political parties went mad. And mm. that is what drove people away. So the public were like, we're not turned on by any of this. Now, some people are. People who really want a hard Brexit to turn on, but people who think that Boris Johnson's like good, go well. This is great. People who like Corbyn were fairly satisfied, but in the end, even if you liked Corbyn, he lost twice. So then, in the end, that's dissatisfying because if you care about Labour or any party, you want it to win because that's the only way you change the world. So I think it's that the people in charge of our political parties were reckless, and that drove the public away. The more you get political parties choosing responsible leaders, the public will come back. It's not a huge change that really needs to happen. But I also think politicians need to, to understand where the public are. The public aren't massively ideological. They just want a better life for themselves and they want a better life for the people they care about and wider society. 
that's not rocket science. Mm. So there are, I mean, Boris Johnson as a prime minister, you're like, I can't, I actually can't believe it happened. Mm. You're still like, even now when you're like, we're rolling a vaccine out, you're like, he's the one in charge of all this. I mean, I, I, I can't. I, I, no, no, no. And I, no, I think we are. We're going to, we're going to get a, are we going to get a, 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 a vaccine? <laughs> and, and you say, I can't feel any level of, there's only so much confidence I can ever have in a government that is led by that. I can't believe he's in charge. Of course people are turned off by politics, cos you're like, that's not a serious leader. Fucking right. I doubt he does the shopping in his house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, would... if it's a family shop, he's got about eight options. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, man. That was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give up for the wonderful Matt oh, Thank you.